Alright, I'm going to get started. I know we got some people still trailing in, um, but want to keep us all on time. After all, we've got lunch next. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. Uh, so I want to get a sense for kind of who's here. Could you raise your hand if you've ever been a jerk while you're trying to get something done? Yeah, like we're all friends. It's okay, right? I've been that jerk. You know, so early in my career, I thought, I don't need those soft skill things. The facts will show me. <laughs> the facts will show me right. And obviously I figured out that there's, that's not right. In fact, the interpersonal skills will make or break you. And facts are an ineffective way to work with other people and collaborate. I've learned some things on the way. I'm going to sh talk to you about them today. Okay. So this is your law of two feet slide. Um, I'm going to talk about tribalism and cognitive biases, the things that get in the way of us collaborating effectively with other people. And then I'm going to talk about some negotiation skills that will help us overcome that. Um, so, um, these topics are very rich and have a lot of detail. I've stripped out nuances and details. If you want to geek out with me about this afterwards, oh, so very happy to do so. Um, these things I'm going to talk about are really uncomfortable when you're looking in the mirror, some of these human failings. So, make it a little uncomfortable through some of this. Just hang with it, it gets better. Uh, I don't have silver bullets. If you are looking for the one size fits all that's gonna solve all your collaboration problems, door. <laughs> and, uh, and, and lastly, um, this stuff is simple, but it's not easy. It's actually pretty tough to make it happen. It was the Global Scum Gathering here in 2018. It was the last session of the last day of the breakouts. And I'm sitting at the table, waiting for it to start, and I'm very involved with what I'm doing on my phone. And there's another woman at the table, and she's trying to engage me in conversation. I'm like, I'm sorry, I really need to buy these concert tickets. And she's like, oh, who is it for? Michael Fronte. Her whole face lit up. She shows me her Michael Fronte concert t-shirt. And we, so we start talking about the pre-sale code and how you get it. We exchange phone numbers. We do all the group work together. We connected instantly. That is tribalism. I know tribalism is getting a lot of press right now with nationalism and all that. But there's a lot more to it than that. And I want to talk about that part of it. I like to bake. I'm like I give gifts to friends, family all the year. I'm not a professional baker. I'm not Great British Bake Off good. But I'm friends and family like it when I bake good. Who likes to bake? Yeah. Isn't it great? You spend a couple of hours. I'm super impressed, by the way, by how many people who are bakers in this audience. I just love, like, you go into the kitchen and you put some effort into it, and people are so happy and pleased that you put this effort into it for them. And watching them go, hmm, even when they know they shouldn't, especially when they know they shouldn't, isn't that awesome? Okay, let's get serious. Who measures by volume, by weight instead of by volume? Yeah, oh wow, lots of you, awesome, yeah. It's so much more accurate. Don't you get a better bake when you do this, right? And it's less to clean up. There's less measuring cups and all that kind of stuff. Yes, the real bakers. Those of us that measure by, by weight, we are the real bakers. So, pretty trivial example, but how'd you feel? If you're not a baker, did you just kind of check out for a while? Feel a little not included? Do you feel solidarity with your other non-bakers or your <laughs> bakers by, by weight? Right? We form tribes very easily. 
It turns out we will form tribes over literally random things, nothing. Group red, group blue, left side, right side. This is my left and my right, <laughs> right? Why do we do that? In order to have a group, there has to be some criteria for membership. Whether it's geographic, political, social, something else. Your group has to have boundaries. There has to be people on the outside. If it doesn't have boundaries, you're everybody. We also need to be part of a group to enhance our self-esteem as individuals. We need to feel like we're accepted into the group and that the group has status. If the group has status, we feel good. If the group status is lowered, we feel bad. And we need to do things to improve the status of the group. Because our self-esteem is intrinsically tied to that of the group. Let's see how this might play out. So think of a public group that you associate with very strongly. Something that you identify strongly enough that you would say, I'm an X, whatever X is. Something might be like you're a fan of a certain sports team. Maybe it's your alma mater, the city or state, Minnesotans, you Wisconsin people. <laughs> For me, I'm a great British Bake Off fan, of course. Now, think about a time that somebody high up in this group that you associated with did something to diminish the status of the group, preferably not something illegal. How do you feel? And then think about somebody from the outside attacking the group for that person's behavior. How did you feel? Did you feel ashamed, embarrassed? Why would you feel that way? It wasn't you that did anything wrong. So for me, it would be like Paul Hollywood, the host of the Great British Bake Off, measuring by volume. I mean, not that he would. Not that he would. I just pretend, right? Because that would be really embarrassing. I would have to say something like, well, wasn't that the time he was a guest host here in America? I bet they didn't even give him a scale. I'm sure. That's got to be it. I bought some cookies that I baked into work the other day, and I set them out on the table for people to share. And later, I saw a couple of coworkers there, and one was holding in her hand. She had this nasty look on her face. And then they laughed. And I thought for a moment, oh my gosh, are they laughing at my cookies? I mean, it was a new recipe, and I didn't really have the technique down. But I didn't really think they were that ugly. Wow, with those. Hey, Joelle, cookies are amazing. I was just talking about how I would have to justify to my trainer if I ate the whole plate. Thanks. Hostile attribution bias is the tendency to assume hostile intent when the, even when the behaviors are ambiguous or benign. I was looking for a recipe for some guests that were coming over. And I went to my favorite website. They encourage measuring by weight instead of by volume. I found the recipe that I liked. I put it in my favorite recipe app so that I could tweak it a little and have it ready for later and for, so I could find it again later. It turned out great. I guess love it. They asked for the recipe and I said, oh, it's by, vol it's by weight. I guess I could convert it for you so that you could use it. Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, and remember information in a way that supports our pre-existing biases. Motivation, mo motivated reasoning is confirmation bias taken to the next level. 
So not only do we search for this information that supports our beliefs, we discredit information that contradicts it. And then further, we will, dis we will, take this, we will discredit the source or the information regardless, actively discredit, <sighs> actively discredit the source of the in contrary information without logic or evidence. So this is me going to some other website to find the recipe. I go through the long, long introduction and notice that she's talking about how to measure by volume appropriately. Oh, wow. I, she can't be any good. These reviews are probably, you know, coerced or made up, I'm sure. This recipe's got to be awful. I'm going to go back to my favorite website, and I'm going to search for something there. So hostile attribution bias, confirmation bias, and motivated reasoning are just three of nearly 300 cognitive biases. So what is a cognitive bias? It's just a systematic error in thinking that affects our judgments and decisions. Humans make assumptions. We take mental shortcuts. Sometimes we don't have enough information to make the decision. Sometimes we have too much and we have to filter it out. Sometimes timing is more important than accuracy. So how does this all fit together? By not spilling water down our shirt. That's how that. We like to think that we use facts to form our opinions. This is largely not true. We start with our tribal values form our personal values, which informs our opinions and then our beliefs. And then we use confirmation bias and motivated reasoning to collect facts to support them. Does this disturb you? It sure disturbs me. Like the logic and rational side of me actively rejects this. But leaves are like, er, <laughs> facts are like leaves on the tree of our values. If you discredit a fact that I use, I will update that in my head as being incorrect. I will let that leaf fall from the tree. But it doesn't change the branches. I will just go get my sunshine from other leaves. I'll find new facts to support my opinions. Furthermore, if your leaf picking gets really close to the trunk of my values, you will then start invoking hostile attribution bias, confirmation bias, and motivated reasoning. Because my self-esteem is tied to that of the tribe. If you're thinking, Whoa, those other humans, they are so irrational. How do I get anything done? Take a step back. I've got a bonus cognitive bias for you. The bias blind spot. Whenever I think about this stuff, my brain comes up with this long list of things, of reasons why this is not true for me. It'll say to me, oh, you used to believe in measuring by volume, that that was the way to go. You got other facts, now you measure by weight. Clearly, this does not apply to you. My own bias, blind spot. So here we are. We've got assuming hostile intent, non-fact-based opinions, forming tribes over nothing, and actively discrediting contrary, inf contrary information. How do we do better? We negotiate. Now you might be thinking, wait, isn't negotiation for like peace treaties and contracts and stuff like that? No. Negotiation is what we do every day when we work with other people to make a decision. 
if someone thinks about things differently than you, or has different i has see or um, wants different things than you do, you need to negotiate to get things done. Examples of negotiating are um, figuring out what to do on your next product, figuring out what to do with friends when you're going to go out for an, an evening out, buying that lamp with your significant other, getting your child to eat or sleep. You know, life. We negotiate all the time, every day. So learning negotiation skills is going to help us throughout our lives, not just at work. I'm going to talk about three core ideas in negotiation. Number, negotiation concept number one, your interests are different than your positions. So the best way to explain the difference between interest and positions is the story of an orange. We have guests coming over, my husband, who's a cook, and I are going to make our amazing dishes for our guests. We both need an orange. There's only one. To keep peace in the house, we cut it in half. I take my half of the orange, I zest it to make my cake, it's not as orangey as I'd like, but not going to argue about it. He takes his half and he juices it to make his sauce. Not as much sauce as he'd like, but what are you going to do? Wanting the orange is our positions. The zest and the juice are our interests. Positions are more likely to be combative interests are more likely to be able to find shared solutions. So we're trying to solve a problem. We develop, we have our interests, the things that actually solve the problem, the outcomes we're trying to accomplish. And then we develop positions in order to accomplish our interests. So get clear about what your interests are and what your positions are and which they're not and really get into your interests. Like why is that so, the, the important thing? And then when you talk to other people, tell them. This is what's important to me and why. When you start out with what your interests are, you relieve hostile attribution bias because you've told them. <laughs> I'm getting there. Okay. Negotiation concept number two, value can be created or destroyed. If value can't be created or destroyed, it's a zero-sum situation. Usually value can be created or destroyed. If nothing else, there's the relationship between you and the other person. But usually, you can get what matters most to you, and I can get what matters most to me. If you're in a situation where value can be created or destroyed, most of the time, you should try to maximize value, right? To maximize the value, you need to understand the potential value that there is. Okay, so that means for me to, get, for me to maximize value, I need to know what you want. So how do I do that? Try asking, it helps. It'll make you better than, uh, randomly, 80% of people. How many times have you thought, I don't think they really care what I think? Ask them, what matters to you most about this thing? And then zip it for like two minutes. Be curious. Try to understand what, they're, what they want. Listen to understand, not to respond. If you ask, say anything, ask them, what, why is that the part that's important to you? Word and tone are important here. Why is that the part that's important to you? Is very different than, why is that important? So don't do that. We 
have strong desires to solve problems. So if we want to put other th focus on other things, the relationship, curiosity, learning, we need to work hard to put those front and center. So here's how you can do that. You can set a goal for the conversation. I'm going to listen to them for five minutes. Or this is too complicated. We're not going to make a decision in this meeting. Depending on your relationship, they might not trust you. If that's the case, be really clear about your interests. So keep coming back to those. Stay focused on them. If they won't tell you what is important to them, you could try saying, well, if I was in your situation, I would be concerned about X. If you're wrong, they'll probably correct you. Listening to them and working to understand their point of view helps create connection between you. Negotiation concept number three, avoid the debate. As we start problem solving, we have our interests, we develop positions to support our interests. Then we talk about our positions, we refine our positions, we defend our positions, we debate the value of our positions. We get attached to our positions. And it's from this place that we will sacrifice the underlying interest we get so focused on the debate of the right versus wrong and winning versus losing that we forget about what's actually important. After all, if you're in a debate and you change your mind and you learn, you're the loser. Everybody goes into these situations thinking that they're right, and they've got well-formed positions. So let's unpack that. We have a disagreement. I think I'm right. That means you're wrong. If you're wrong, that means you're either out to get me, or you're ignorant. So I either need to fight you, or I need to teach you. Now I've invoked my own hostile attribution bias, and I'm likely to invoke yours. It's easy to get caught in the traps of our tribalism and our cognitive biases, so it helps to plan for these conversations when you're in a calm, rational state. Try framing it up as a mystery. What do you know that I don't? Why do you think differently than I do? And then remember that you're probably going to feel like you get backed up into a corner. So identify what are your hot button issues, and then what are you going to do when you start feeling those tensions rise? When you build something with other people, you invoke the positive side of tribalism. So in short, understand what you want and why you want it. Understand what they want, why they want it and find a way to bring those things together. Simple, but hard. We all fall into the traps of tribalism and cognitive biases. We will all have, we will all be suspicious when others' behavior does not conform to our expectations. We will all seek out information that confirms what we already believe. We will all reject information that goes against our tribal and, and personal values. And we will all see them more easily in other people than we will in ourselves. We are all human. So doing, doing it better is trying. The effort is the important part here. You get better over time, make progress. Success 
is trying to do it differently. So, to get your way without being a jerk, negotiate. Focus on your intents, interests over your positions. Maximize value. Plan ahead to avoid human failings. This talk is thanks to a guy named David McCraney. He's got a blog and a podcast called You Are Not So Smart. He started it to explore self-delusion. This is what got me started on this rabbit hole. You should all go check this out. Is there a chance you could go back to that previous slide? That, was, that has a lot of good content, I feel. I will be sharing the slides. OK. Yeah. I can. Sit here. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, allergies, I swear. So here are the links for the contact to the talk. I will be sharing the slides. I'm Joel Tegwin. Thank you for your time and attention. And remember, measure by weight, not by volume. Thank you.